Hello, everybody. We are live this afternoon with one of my dear friends, Dr. Joy Miller. I am just absolutely delighted to talk to her today because she is a wealth of information and she has done some absolutely amazing things, which she'll tell you about today in the last, uh, well, her whole lifetime. But there's been a few really significant things that I've been a part of this last year. Um, and we'll hear all about that today. Our key word today is resiliency. Um, and both Joy and I um, have stories of our patients, our clients, our friends, and ourselves, and how we have hacked resiliency. And today, um, I just know this is gonna be like listening into two friends with coffee um, about just stuff that we've learned. And every time we get on the phone, we can be uh, thousands of miles apart and even like hours or months or years apart and just jump right back in just where we left off. Um, I'm definitely going to introduce her formally, but I want to tell you about this woman as a friend. Um, I remember back in Peoria, Illinois, when I was medical director of the Integrative Medical Center with Methodist, seems like lifetimes ago, and we connected, I think, at one of the events that we did, and it was just an instant friendship, like an instant recognition of souls. And um, you've heard me rave about friends on this show before, but um, Joy is just a dear, precious friend. And like I said, it can be, sometimes it's a, a year or two before we talk in between, but we just pick right back up where we left off. And one of the things recently we were talking about is just how do we take care of ourselves during these times? And for two recovering perfectionists and people pleasers, <laughs> you're gonna hear just a little bit about our stories today because we, we love to serve, we're healers, um, and that's our gift to the world. And we love what we do. But our conversation was revolving around how do we actually really set good boundaries and make sure that we're doing the self-care stuff that we teach everybody else how to do. So you're gonna hear us talk about that today and hopefully just get some pearls for yourself because it's not even really about us, but. I I'm hoping that our conversation will spark in you um, just some ideas and things of maybe where you've not been taking care of yourself or maybe when, where, where you've been worried too much about what other people think. And again, this is just coming from a real place in our own hearts of as we you know, walk through life and continue to try to um, achieve more, but also just be better, um, better for uh, the people that we serve. So I hope you'll enjoy this today. Of course, this will be recorded. So if you miss it, you can um, re-listen to it. I'll be sure in any links that we talk about I will add them to the chat box. And then this will be on our YouTube channel, which is under my name, Jill Carnahan, um, into infinity. So if you want to watch it, we'll be sure and share it there as well. So let me give just a little bit of a formal introduction. Um, Dr. Joy Miller has so many accolades, so I could spend uh, 20 minutes talking about her, but her basic background, she's an internationally known licensed psycho psychotherapist, professional trained author, and she's a founder of a great um, center in Peoria, Illinois, Joy, Joy Miller and Associates. Um, she is an Illinois State Licensed Clinical Professional Counselor, as well as Certified Master Addictions Counselor. Additionally, she's been part-time instructor at Bradley University and was faculty and mentor at Walden University Doctoral Psychology Program. Um, she's a leading authority in relationship issues and Holocaust studies. Uh, it's one of the reasons I love her, just because she's such a wealth of knowledge. Um, if you want more information, her website is joymiller.com, and I hope you'll go there because I am not even coming close to scratching the surface of all the stuff, the published books that she's done, um, the programs, the Women's Lifestyle Show, and most, re most recently, the Resiliency uh, 2020 in September, So, um, and I'll let her tell you a little bit about some of those things, but welcome, Dr. Joy Miller, and friend, it is wonderful to see you. It is so good to see you. You look wonderful. Thank you. You too. And I know you've been staying safe during COVID and also trying to spend time with your precious son and grandbaby. Is it two now? Two. I thought so. How old are your grandbabies? Four and one. Oh gosh. And I bet they love Grandma Joy. <laughs> well, they, do. they get away with whatever. So they love it. Exactly. Well, thanks so much for taking the time today. And what we wanted to dive in today, again, we just kind of mentioned it on the phone and then I know um, we both thought that this would be helpful for people is um, both of us have really been touched by um, Edith Eager, who's an incredible woman, written um, two books recently, The Choice and The Gift, and I can include links to these. And the reason I was introduced to her was actually on your Resiliency 2020. Tell us just a little bit about what you just did recently and how many people it touched. I really want people to hear this and go back and sign up for the next one. Well, <laughs> It was just one of these events that was a miracle in my life. Uh, I don't even know 
really where to start. Uh, we were going to do a resiliency conference and then the pandemic came and we had to punt and I decided to do a streaming webinar. And in the process, we already had a couple of celebrities, but we thought, I wonder if we can get some more. We already had Ariana Huffington and we had Alanis Morissette and, um, we just started contacting more and more people. Uh, I called Erin Brockovich because I knew her and she said, of course, I'll do this. And we ended up getting 27 celebrities from all disciplines to talk about resilience. And everyone spoke with their own voice. They donated their time, their energy to the cause. And um, our purpose was to just have different voices speak about resiliency, their views of what helped them become resilient. And it ended up being a four and a half hour streaming webinar, which included 5,000 participants wow. from 69 countries around the world. And we also, for a final speaker, ended up getting Glenn Close, which was a surprise to everyone, but then we didn't tell who the final person was, and we ended up getting Dr. Jill Biden wow. to be our finale speaker. It was an amazing event. Um, we have, um, at this point, um, we had 444 people that downloaded the webinar after the event, and we have a constant kind of barrage of people saying, can we watch this? Can we see it again? So we're making arrangements right now to make that possible. Oh, good. And can they, where can they find more information about that event, about potential future events? Well, they would go to Resiliency 20, well, now it's resiliency2021.com. And um, we're hoping in the next two weeks that people will be able to sign up to re -see the, uh, replay the webinar and to find out information about next year. And Jill, you're one of the participants for, our, for next year. Um, I just found out that Ariana Huffington will be joining us, um, Rhonda Ross, Edith will be joining us, okay. Edith Eager. Uh, we have, I think at this point, we have almost 15 different um, celebrities that are signed up already, and it'll be September 9th of next year. Oh, I am, Joy, I am totally beyond honored to be part of it and was this year too. I was, I was joking because I'm like, I don't belong in this crowd, but, <laughs> but it's just, it's truly an honor that you've asked me and I, I really enjoyed it and I can't wait till next year. I can't either. I can't either. So. Oh. Um, well, this is, and this is how, so I, I'm going to tell you a little background. I think I shared a little with you, but for listeners, so I grew up um, with stories of Holocaust survivors, and I grew up with um, especially the, um, the right, they call her the righteous Gentile, <laughs> Corey Ten Boom, um, who actually hid in her house um, some of the Jewish survivors, and her and her sister were in Auschwitz, and her sister died. Um, and I just... I have had such a heart. I, I'm not Jewish, <laughs> but I, I love you and I love all my friends who have that heritage so much. And I, ha I love um, just the resilience that you have shown and, and the voice that you bring. And I have such, I don't know why, but for some reason, it touches my heart very deeply of the suffering that your um, generations have gone through. And Edith, especially, I had not known about her, but as I read her books, I love them and I love her so much if you haven't read the gift and the choice the choice was the first version of her, the book of her life story and memoir and it is so impactful and then the gift is more recently and I highly recommend reading these both books Edith Eager E-G-E-R is her name and she is just the most beautiful soul you could ever and you can hear her um, I actually got the audible version which aren't they aren't read by her but they're the beautiful voice and you can hear her words. Um, and of course, I have the book copy. I have the copy right here, the gift <laughs> right in front of me. Um, and I think this was part of our conversation in the sense of, I, I just felt like what I love about that, and she even mentions Corey Ten Boom in her book, one of her books, because the theme there is number one is how do we foster resilience in the most horrific things in life. And I don't think any of us could come close to what she experienced. So as much as you're going through right now, 
um, which may be really difficult or horrible. I don't think any of us could ever claim to come close to what she went through. But each of us in our journey, in the difficulties, it doesn't really matter. We can't really compare. And even Edith is sense, says that. Um, but what I loved is um, the theme of love and forgiveness and how this impacts our life and ability to be resilient. Um, I would love, would you comment a little bit about how she might have impacted you or how long you've known her or your relationship? I'd love to hear more from you, Joy. Well, Edith is new to me as well. Um, my studies were on the Holocaust and I worked with the United States Holocaust Museum in Washington and I am on the board in Chicago on the with the Holocaust Museum and I originally worked with 15 different survivors who were all in Auschwitz all women and my study was looking at how women coped mm -hmm. so this has been my journey for the last 20 years and as I was teaching a class one of my students said oh today I'm going to go hear Edith Eager and I was like, who's Edith Eager? Yeah. And he said, how could you not know this? Right. <laughs> and he said, you know, she is so well known. And I started looking her up and she, her book was recommended by Bill Gates and um, by Oprah. And she said it was the most life-changing book she'd ever read. Now, Edith is an Auschwitz survivor. She went in at, I think, 16 as she came um, through the lines um, she came to Dr. Mengele, who was at the front of the line, um, and he determined if she was going to live or die. What he asked of her was to dance in front of him. And so she was an Olympic athlete at that time. And the way she actually survived was to take herself to another place in her mind. She believes that our freedom comes from our choice of what we do in our mind. And that just touched me beyond belief. It was something that in all of my research, I had never heard anyone say it in that way. I knew that somehow people had to take themselves away from the experience, but the way she spoke about the choice and how it creates freedom, it touched something in me and obviously it touched something in you. Yeah. Yeah, I feel, I, I, I love that. That's just a beautiful uh, snippet of her beautiful life. And what, same thing, what touched me so much is I've not had anything close to her difficulties or trauma in my life, but I've had little traumas. And I do believe that there's this, the resilience core is the belief that um, and of course, Viktor Frankl's written extensively about this and been a hero of ours as well, um, that will, no one can take away, number one, Edith talks about what's in our minds, and number two, that will to survive, like you can be physically beaten, mentally tortured, all kinds of things, but that will inside of you, the soul level, no one can touch that, no one can take that, and no one can damage that. And that should give us all hope, because despite the outside world, um, we have that ability to transcend difficulties. And I, I mean, again, in some of my small difficulties relative, um, I do remember this idea that I could trans, I could go to other places. I could kind of, we call it dissociation, right? <laughs> I mean, but you know what? We, we think of that as bad. I was like, oh, it's so bad that I dissociate. Honestly, it's a brilliant skill in the right circumstances. And you, you're the expert here, not me, but my simple way to look at it is I realized, wow, that served me well. I can go to happy Disneyland when I want to. And I saw the other day, this is a silly example. I was getting an MRI. MRIs are incredibly noisy and loud and they're claustrophobic for most of us. I don't even have claustrophobia, but I knew going into there, I had, would have to mentally have strength to endure this like really, really loud noise around my head. It was a brain MRI. Um, um, well, I was there. And so I took it as an opportunity to dissociate consciously. And I did, I literally had a, a, a lucid dream and went to a whole different land, had a whole different, almost like a dream of being awake. And I came out of there and thought, wow, I can do this. Like I can dissociate consciously from a difficult situation and have this incredible experience. Like I literally had probably what average you know, person on drugs would have as a high, but I can do that naturally. And if we can tap in, if we can teach people to tap into that level of consciousness, and I think it comes from practices like prayer, meditation, 
I would love your take on this. Like, how would we teach? We think of dissociation as negative, but there's this piece here where we can harness energy to, to go somewhere um, and be creative. And what do you think of that? Or what's your thoughts on this? You know, it, part of my study was looking at coping strategies. And mm -hmm. one of those was um, dissociation or being numb. Yes. It, it, to, to say it in a different way. Right. <laughs> you think about someone who, let's say, has been raped. Mm -hmm. Or let's say there's incest within the family. The way they survive, many of them, is to do exactly what you've said. Um, in that circumstance, that coping mechanism is very positive. Mm -hmm. And just like with you and the MRI, <laughs> um, something only becomes destructive when we use it too much or we use it to the point that it no longer is beneficial. So let's say we use eating as a coping strategy for stress. When you do it too much, of course, then it becomes negative. But the coping strategies are there for a purpose. And um, I think people that practice meditation learn to take themselves to a, well, you use the word transcend, to take themselves to another place, to whether it's your favorite place by the ocean, or flying in the sky over whatever, you learn and you practice to become better at it and to get to that location faster or that environment or that feeling or seeing that light. And um, it's a very powerful technique. And if you're in a place like Auschwitz, mm -hmm. you need to find a way to transcend. Edith spoke about having hope and she dreamed of going back and being with her boyfriend. Yes. Now, some of my other survivors, uh, their hope was around going back and being with their family. Mm. So relational things are always very powerful, especially for women yeah. as it relates to resiliency. Oh, I love that. Yeah, tell us, let's dive in, because you really are an expert in your field. And um, I would like if you were talking to all of us as your clients and we were looking for like, say there's, you know, we've lost a job or we're struggling with the stress of the children at home schooling or all the things or the uncertainty of our, our world with whether it's politics, which we won't talk about or other things. Um, there's just a lot of things that create stress and we are at an all time high with stressors. I've said this before, but from um, uh, Cellier's work, there's uh, four predictors of stress. They're nuts, novelty, unpredictability, threat to ego, and sense of control. And of course, someone like Edith had all of those every day. Um, we have them off and on. And I think especially in the pandemic, we have a lot of them most days. What would you advise your clients or your listeners here of, of ways that they could deal with the stresses right now? You know, that's a question that I think we're all asking ourselves and people around us. Mm -hmm. Because the, the normal things that we used to use are not working right now. Yeah. Because we've never been in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. So in the past, for me, um, being around other people would have brought me some sense of resilience, mm -hmm. that connection, that, um, that just energy made me alive. Now I don't have it. I, I can't connect, I can't hug, I can't be near someone. So if I'm speaking to my client or more importantly, speaking to myself, I need to look at new ways to um, find that connection and to speak very personally, that would be finding the connection with myself, which yes. is the hardest thing yes. for me. So I would be talking obviously to my clients about right now let's look at what you've tried in the past mm -hmm. what's helped you get through stress what are some other techniques that we could use um does humor help you mm -hmm. does journaling um maybe looking for things to be grateful for every day for me this this whole pandemic the last nine months has been about facing my my worst fear but my greatest fear I guess is being alone. Yes. And this has been the opportunity and it's been the most amazing journey ever. Joy, I couldn't agree more. Um, and what I was just thinking as you're speaking is 
I think the thing that's different here is it's really laid bare. Most people have medicators. I just use that term. I heard it somewhere for whether it's obviously addictions like alcohol, drugs, but there's socially acceptable addictions like work, which has been my past, or like um, even uh, you might, I mean, overeating, uh, undereating, work, um, even relationships or sex or other things can be medicators. And of course, they can be healthy or unhealthy, but anything we use to escape feeling or being in the reality of what's happening happening to us. And um, what I've found for most people, and I will include myself, is during this time, we either have more time or emo more emotional space because we don't have so many options for medicators. Like if we were with people or we were busy or we were doing, we might still be busy or doing or, or you know, on Zoom, but there's more space emotionally to actually have to deal with and process the stuff that maybe we've been able to keep buried up until now. Do you feel like that's accurate? I do, and I really think that's an amazing kind of overview of, of this whole mm -hmm. concept. It's, it's this space that we've never been used to, and I can only speak for myself, but I would fill it with doing something else, yes. or achieving, or writing another book, or starting yes. another company, or who knows what, or taking care of someone. At this particular point, I've been able to use these nine months to see that that's my way, um, my choice to, to not really connect with myself or love myself. And um, once again, it was my biggest fear that if I didn't do these things, mm -hmm. that I wouldn't be loved. So it comes back to that whole relational aspect. And I think for many people, that's what they're discovering right now, a relationship with some people, their families that they hadn't been close to, yes. or this relationship with themselves, hopefully without the medicators. Yes. Oh gosh. And this is where our conversation led. We were both in chapter three of the gift with Edith Eager that we mentioned earlier. It's called all other relationships will end. And I remember us almost on tears in the phone going, oh my gosh, can you believe this? This is so relevant to us. And I wanted to read just a couple little clips and then we'll talk about how it's affected us. Um, she talks about just all relationships will end and in the end we have ourselves and we can't abandon ourselves. And just like you, Joy, I have some deep rooted fears around being alone and even more so because of my history. I was very dissociated during my cancer at 25 and then Crohn's at 26. I think I had to survive and talk about caring for other people. I went into the mode of like making sure everybody was okay because um, that's what I did up until then. And so I never really allowed myself to grieve or feel like the trauma of being diagnosed with an aggressive life, life threatening illness at 25. And so um, I was taking care of other people, but that fear still is in me that I'm working through of like, not only being alone, but being alone and sick. Like that's a big fear of mine that I'm grappling with. But she talks about this. I love it because we can't abandon ourselves. We always have ourselves. And we start to really understand and integrate this. Um, we, we can't really be alone. And for me, I, I have, you know, my faith in God and that presence in my life. And she talks about, so how can you be the best loving, unconditional, no nonsense caregiver to yourself? And then she goes on to say, it's difficult to relinquish our old ways of earning A's and discover new ways to build love and connection. So for people who are overachievers and use work as a medicator, again, amen. <laughs> And then also use like, like we love to serve and take care of other people. And that's a, that's a gift. That's a beautiful thing. But sometimes we can do that instead of either taking care of ourselves or instead of going to the deep roots of why we're doing that. And some of the things that you and I talked about were how, um, to, to no fault of theirs, our family somehow, um, uh, fostered this idea that achievement and taking care of other people was the way that we got love or we just integrated it. It wasn't anyone's fault, but our own, but we did that. And so this is kind of breaking that habit. And then she says, and I love this because my family is very like, um, you know, we don't be selfish, take care of others first, all of those kinds of rules. And she said, it's good to be selfish, to practice self-love and self-care. And I'm relearning that it's not selfish to take care of yourself. Um, and she goes on one more thing I'll read and then we'll talk um, when you're free you take responsibility for being who you really are you recognize the coping mechanisms or behavior patterns you've adopted in the past to get your needs met you reconnect with the parts of yourself you had to give up and reclaim the whole person you weren't allowed to be you break the habit of abandoning yourself remember you have something no, no one else will ever have you have you you have a lifetime 
And then she says, that's why I talk to myself. Edie, you're one of a kind. You're beautiful. <laughs> I just love her. May you be more and more Edie every day. So Joy and Jill, may you be more and more Joy and Jill every day. Um, and then I'm no longer in the habit of denying myself emotionally or physically. I'm proud to be a high maintenance woman. And I love, I'm going to end there and then we'll talk. But I love this because I remember when I traveled back in the day, I would go for a weekend and take two suitcases because often I took a blender and an air filter and the, whatever and extra shoes. And I got in the habit and I decided, you know what? I would say in the elevator when someone said, well, are you going to Europe? And I'd be like, no, I'm going for the weekend. And I said, it's okay to be high maintenance if you're high performance. And they would Ooh. shut up. <laughs> so I'm learning this because I realized, you know what, to take care of myself, it's okay. I'm not going to apologize anymore. That's a lot. But I love comments, Joy, on, on that chapter and how it impacted you because it was profound. It was a profound chapter. And I, and I, I keep going back to, she has always these little quips mm -hmm. that, that uh, I hang on to. And she is formally trained as a logo therapist. So she's always looking for meaning or purpose, um, but she she has this way of saying things. And the the last thing that she that I actually I spoke to her this afternoon, and um, she has something where she says uh, you're depressed because you're not express expressing, and I think that's so true that when we are caught, whether it's a pandemic or in our stress we pull inward, we become depressed, we, we go inside ourselves. And the last nine months, all of us have a choice. We have the freedom to go into that depression and to just become a little ball, or we can take it, start to express look, as we are today, or just like everybody that was on the webinar, to look at this as what can we be grateful for? What have we learned? Where are we finding freedom? I'm finding freedom for the first time to just feel okay with me. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are probably, oh, what is wrong with this woman? I can do that all the time. I'm not, I can't do that because I'm used to taking care of everyone, being a therapist and checking on my patients, my clients, mm -hmm. doing 10 other things. And I got the love that way. Mm -hmm. But I found that if I, this is really maybe stepping too far over, but I felt like if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have the love. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't get what I needed. And so I, it was like this constantly being on this performance treadmill with no way out. Yeah. Oh, thank you for expressing what we're all feeling because that's, I couldn't agree more. It's just my whole journey, same exact parallel. So we, we were just like, I so understand you on the phone recently. Um, the same thing is like, I, I feel this responsibility to respond to every inquiry, every text, every phone call, every need. And I'm realizing in the last nine months that I humanly can't do it. Like the, that amount of response, I, even if I want to, I can't. And a few months ago, it took me to a really kind of a down, um, I've really never been depressed, but I was as close as th to that as I ever could have been because I was just like, the joy was not as bright. It was like my light, instead of being bright, shining was just more of a flicker. And it was this depletion because I was responding to everybody's needs, but my own. And again, there's no selfishness in making sure you get sleep and food and rest and even quiet time. And I wasn't able to take care of all the needs of the world that were demanding on me and then also take care of myself. And so for a while I chose the world and then I realized, oh my gosh, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be okay. My light is going to dim if I don't really go back to the foundation and turn off the phone and stop answering every request that comes my way. And again, I love to, we both love to help people. It's not a obligation. It's not something that we don't enjoy. Like to me, and I know for you too, um, it brings great joy to our lives, but there's a limit to our capacity. And I realized I had hit my limit. Like I couldn't go on like this. And so this whole reformatting of this time for me has been, what is the priority? Where do I want to pour out my energies? And what's going to happen is as I say yes to some things, that means I have to say no to others. And that's hard. Wow. That's a really big question. I know. <laughs> uh, you know, I think first of all, 
it's the exploration of just finding out how far you're stretching yourself and mm -hmm. to really look at that. And we do, a, you know, one of the things that I do a lot for people that are always over responsible for other people or is yeah. to have them become aware of how often they're doing that. So it sounds silly, but I have them put a rubber band on their wrist. Uh -huh. And every time they find themselves feeling like they have to take care of someone or they have to take care of something else aside from themselves, they have to snap their wrist with the rubber band. And most people come back and say, oh my gosh, after two days, my wrists were totally <laughs> sore. I had to take this off. And I think it's just so unconscious for many of us that we forget ourselves. And it's so easy, especially as women, mm -hmm. to care for everyone else. Um, you know, like you, I was taught that I should not be selfish, that my job, my purpose, my role, and especially as a therapist, is to take care of everyone else. That's, as you said, it's not bad, yeah. unless I'm not caring for my own health. But at this point in my life, um, my purpose and my meaning has changed. It's now about giving, giving back in a different way with my heart and more honesty and, um, and, and trying to do it not as a way to, to achieve love or achievement, but to just be with someone in a different way and to be with life in a different way yeah. where I'm part of it, not, not a vehicle for fixing things for people. I don't know if that made sense, but that totally makes sense. I love how, how you, how you explain this because again, so relevant. Um, and the thing that came to mind, um, that I know I've struggled with in the past is like having needs, right? Uh, like, uh, expressing needs and having needs. I think I had somewhere learned along the line where it's better to not have needs and you definitely don't express them. <laughs> so like this idea that I might actually need something from somebody else, but what you realize is like, say you call a friend and like, I'm really struggling. Can you go on a walk with me? Or, um, I would love some time with you. Would you have time for coffee? Or, um, I am in such a bind. Is there any way you could uh, pick up the dog for me? I would never try to ask those things of other people, right? right? But the truth is that's a, that's ability to allow them to love you um, back. And so you're actually denying them of some of the love that a friendship or relationship could have. But that's a struggle I've had is actually expressing or, or acknowledging that I actually have needs. Absolutely. And that I can't do it all myself. Yeah. And I think to be resilient, you have to be able to, to see that you can you need other people or to allow people to be part of your life. Mm -hmm. And as you said, sharing, whether we're miles apart, yeah. years apart, we can ask of each other and it feels safe. I think it's also important that we mention that to do this, you have to be with safe people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. For and sure. that really is a disclaimer that needs to be said. To be resilient, you have to find safe people in your life. Um, if you keep going back to the people that have harmed you, you're probably going to get harmed again. Yeah. And so it's important as a part of resiliency to really kind of, and I know this is hard for so many people, but to just let some relationships go by the side. Yeah. Joy, I, I, again, I love your words of wisdom because I feel like I've learned that the last several years and I have so many beautiful friendships and relationships and I've had a very few that have been pretty toxic. And what I realized is for someone who's an empath and an energetic being in the extreme level, I really feel other people. It's this gift because it helps me to feel patience and understand where they're coming from and understand what they need from diagnostic perspective. But on the other side of it, I realized more than ever, especially recently, I really have to protect that inner circle. Like I can't have any negativity. I just can't. I would love to, but I, I, my body won't allow 
allow it, it won't function because energetically I feel it, it takes me down. So I've been really working on that as well um, and setting good boundaries. Not that they can't be, you know, connections or relationships in some capacity, but the inner circle, I'm really specific about who I allow, allow there because my body and my mind and my spirit um, don't do negativity. <laughs> well, and, and I think it's relational and also environmental. Mm -hmm. because you wouldn't put bad food in, yeah. into your body at this time, right. but you have things surrounding you. I look at, I look at your room and it's so Jill because yeah. I see the things around you that you love. And when you choose to be more yourself, you, you put more things around you that, that illustrate the real you. And, and I see it there. I think um, as we clear out our lives, we do bring things around us that are more nurturing and loving versus things that we feel like we have to have. Oh, I love that. And I have to tell you a funny story about this room because <laughs> you'll get this. And I'm sure the people listening might too, but it's a, it's a funny story. So I used to love the color red. I bought a red BMW motorcycle. I like bright red. I'd wear red, like bright, you know, in your face red. And I recently redecorated, got some new things in the kitchen and probably in the last year or so, all of a sudden I look around my house and I have a lot of this beautiful teal. And I joke like this is a metaphor for my transformation in the last several years because red is very, very masculine, very in your face, very, very vibrant and, and loud. Um, and I think it was compensation for the fear of like either not being protected or not that being in touch with that feminine side and lots of things. I won't go into this as a whole psychological discussion, but all of that to say, you get the idea. Red is a little different than this very gentle teal color. Like I come in here and I literally am like, oh. I love this room. It so feels like my soul feels refreshed and calm. And then now in my kitchen, everything has, it was accidental. I had no plan, but I looked around subconsciously. Everything's now teal. So I joked with a friend, I'm going to have to repaint my, my BMW motorcycle to a beautiful teal color. <laughs> But this, like, it's a metaphor for the transformation from accepting all parts of ourselves. And I've talked to another fellow medical doctor who's a woman in this masculine world. And we talked about the years, 10 years ago, you remember this, I would wear a black pantsuit when I'd speak. That's yes. not me. Like I, but I did because I had to fit into this masculine world. I'm actually this delicate flower. I hate saying that. <laughs> I'm actually really tough too, but my, I, I'm really sensitive and I never acknowledged that half of me for most of my life. I felt like I had to be tough. I had to be masculine. I had to be red. And all of a sudden in this transformation, I'm embracing this delicate, tender, sensitive side. I'm sitting and meditating instead of running out and doing orange theory. These transformations are very, very real. And so most of us have a bent towards one side or the other. But when we acknowledge the full spectrum of ourselves, all of a sudden we redecorate. <laughs> so interesting. And I, I, I never really considered the red part of you. You remember, right? Like you probably knew, you know me, you know, but didn't, wouldn't you say the years ago when you, I was much more masculine and, and I feel like I've, I've really transformed and tried to embrace that other side of me. <laughs> well, I feel like you or me, I mean, you'll people behind me, I've, I've got the red, my uh -huh. is in red here um, and then very Asian, but okay. I feel that tranquility from the environment and the color um, allows me to be expressive for the first time for myself. I love it. When it's it's like we else. have these both sides. Again, the red is, there's nothing wrong with, I love red and I love my red BMW and I love the teal, but it's almost like, how do we find these? And I think the environment, the color can actually help us be more of who we were meant to be. Cause I love your decor. I'm, I, I've seen other parts of your home and other places and I think it's absolutely stunning. And I can see how it would encourage you to have more of a voice. Absolutely. And you know, we're talking about this and it's funny because I've been talking to two people who are actually decorators and designers about being part of the resiliency conference, because I really believe that our environment and shaping it and creating a design around us in all ways is a very, very powerful tool to kind of express not only ourselves, but to find some peace and some tranquility. I mean, it's kind of like if you go to a hospital, 
you'd never paint the, the room red. Yeah. There's yeah. a reason why they paint it yellow or blue. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to be yeah. calm. Exactly. Oh, I love that. And I love how this is, because it really is an expression. This transformed when I painted this room and who knew? And now everything's teal instead of <laughs> red. Um, one thing as we were talking before, it reminded me of one of the last summaries of this chapter and just a practical tip we could give to listeners is Edith talks about writing for a day or a week in your journal. What percentage of time do you spend on work? love and play. And sometimes like say you're in the clinic, say either one of us are seeing clients, we might be loving and working at the same time. Um, and I just thought about that. I haven't really done the exercise yet, like over a 24 hour period, but I'm guessing I might be like 80% work and 10% play. And well, the love I think would be in there. So maybe 50 to 60% love or yeah, love 80% work and then like 10% play. I'm not very good at playing, but I was encouraged by that because I think like that's an area of growth. And one thing I've done three years ago, I had some friends who loved to color and I was like, oh brother, I never, I don't have time for that. Like who would sit down and color? It's a waste of time. Well now Joy, I literally drive around in my car and I have a bag of coloring books, colored pencils and pens, because if I happen to stop at a coffee shop and meet a friend, um, we will often now color and I love it. And it's playing. It's playful. It's interesting because it also connects you back to your inner child yeah. and part of your inner child that you didn't get to have. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's for many people, you know, one way to really not only express themselves in a new way, um, but also to connect to parts of themselves that um, many times as children, we find ways to protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. We find ways to be more resilient. And then we lose those techniques mm -hmm. and those capabilities because it's not cool or uh, we, we think, think it's stupid. But, you know, I find myself coloring all the time. It's great to have a granddaughter because- Oh, I love it. All, <laughs> all the time yeah. and do crafts. <laughs> I love it. And I've seen some of your darling videos and they just make me smile. Oh, I love it. Um, gosh, there's so much else we could say. You know, one thing else that might be practical to leave with people. I remember this, I wrote this, this is in my journal from Edith's book that it was, it, she was talking about when she sees clients um, she's a psychotherapist and she would always ask these four questions. And so this might be practical for you guys listening. Um, she'd say, and this would be to liberate yourself from victimhood. So kind of part of that chapter, she said, what do you want like for yourself, not for anybody else? And the second question is who wants it? Because often we're like, oh, well, my dad wants me to go to school to be a doctor. Well, what do you want? You know, what do you want? Um, so it's just like separating that out from not just what you want or think people want you to want, but what you actually want. So the second question is who wants it? Is it you or somebody else? The third question is, well, what are you going to do about it? Because often we have these dreams, these ideas, these things to free us to be the person we're meant to really be. But the last question is when, like, when are you going to do it? So I'm making a plan. And I just, I wrote this down because I thought, what a great thing for me to really check in with myself every bit about what do we really want and how do we get there? And I'd love to hear, Joy, you have done so many amazing things and I can't even begin to name them all. You've written at least seven books. And you've, um, you've, you've uh, done the uh, Women's Lifestyle Show in Puria that's been super successful for decades because it was when I was back there. Now the resiliency and many, many, many other things. Um, what's next for Joy Miller? What, where, where are you? What would you like to see yourself? It's, a, it's an interesting question because someone said to me once, uh, we, we spend half a year in Florida mm -hmm. and there's a, our dear friends, um, one of them is, is a physician, and he knows me and he's saying, Joy, why do you keep doing these things? You know, you've done it all. You, you see something, you do it, whatever. Why can't it just be enough? Mm -hmm. And the point for me, and I've heard Edith say the same That's thing. Because it was when I was, sorry. Is, is that time is limited. I want to be able to experience and feel everything that I possibly can. Mm -hmm. So whether it's spending time with my grandchildren or walking on the beach or whatever, I, I really think that what I want at this point, the when is now for me. And it's really to allow myself to not necessarily 
um, get awards, achievements, whatever, but to really be with the universe and breath and life and to watch the ocean and to really be with people. Right now, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to just meet someone and to say, tell me how you got where you got. Mm -hmm. I want to hear about you. I don't want to hear your achievements. I mean, all that stuff is just different clothes. Yeah. Yes, I've done a lot of things. Yes, I've had achievements. But I really want people to know the real inside of me. And if they're not willing or they have no interest, then I need to move on. Yeah. Yeah. And so right now, the when is for me is now, and it's to be the, the most real I can possibly be. Mm. Gosh, we are so aligned. I feel the same way. Just like, what does this really look like? Because am I on, I always joke about the dancing bear, which is like a performer. Um, and a lot of times in my life, I felt like uh, I had to perform to achieve love or achieve um, compensation, whatever. And I'm moving away from that model. I want to just be myself and not be dancing for accolades <laughs> any longer. And, and like you said, just be seen and loved for me. Now, I love what I do in medicine. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to stop seeing patients. Um, that, that's a, such a joy for me. It gives me such joy. And I love to do that. But the other things, maybe the, the, I traveled a lot before March of this year. And it was really hard on my body. I don't think I acknowledged it. And so I think things are going to be different. Um, and then writing is this creative kind of solo endeavor, and it takes a lot of time alone. I, I love it. It's still very difficult, but that's a whole different thing. So who knows? But I'm doing the same thing as reevaluating where, our, you know, where does the most joy come from and the relationships that we have and the connections. And even like our conversation, spending time with you, I have such great joy with, with our conversations, Joy. <laughs> can, I, can I just add that yeah. um, I think it's really important that people – that are listening, take time and look at what have they learned during these last nine months? What, what can you be grateful for? What have you, um, I guess there's so many, um, there's terrible parts of it. I've lost one of my dearest friends mm -hmm. during this time. Um, and I'm fearful that I'm going to lose my husband who has cancer. Mm -hmm. But there are so many wonderful things here. And I'm hoping that people can see that part of resiliency is about looking at those things and celebrating the successes that you've made. You've made it through nine months. Mm -hmm. You've done whatever you need to do. You're taking steps. And I think sometimes we forget what we're accomplishing. And no one has ever done what we have done in these last nine months. We are really amazing. If you have made it through this, yeah. This is something that no one else has ever done. And you deserve to get a lot of credit because we've been through something pretty dramatic yeah. and we hopefully are coming out the other end soon. Yes. Yes. I love that you say that because it is, it's just that building that confidence that we are going to make it. Um, and, um, and yeah, if you need some encouragement, go get Edith's books. I, they're so both so good. <laughs> I can't recommend one over the other. Um, Final words, Joy, what would you say to leave people? You've just given us some great tip, tidbits of hope. Anything else you want to leave um, people with as far as just hope or resilience or um, tools to get through? I, I think I'd like to leave people with, um, I guess, the hope that you take time to look at what is your purpose, to try and to discover that. But more importantly, to look at right now who you are and what you can be grateful for within yourself. Mm. And it's not about where we're going. It's about what we're discovering within ourselves. Wow. I love that. Cause that means anything outside can be changing and, um, and uncertain. And you still have this groundedness um, here that just transcends all of that. Um, so I love it. And it's also, you know, I've always heard what we focus on grows. And so we can focus on the good, the grateful, the relationships, um, the people we love, the people we have in our inner circle, um, all of our patients, our clients, all of those things, or we can focus on the negative. And I choose to focus on the good. And that definitely gets me through a lot of days. Uh, and, and I have the choice to find wonderful people in my life. And you are one of them. Uh, and everyone that's listening, 
to you right now. They are so lucky to have you in their life. You are really amazing. Thank you, Joy. I feel the same about you. You have touched so many lives and I just, I'm grateful. The universe had a definite plan for us to connect and who knows what the future holds. Um, well, where can people, we gave your website, is it joymiller.com, your, your main website, and then resiliency2021.com. Is there anywhere else you want to give for people to find you or? No, I think they can find me at one of those two places Perfect. for sure. Perfect. I don't hide too well. <laughs> I love it. And be sure and uh, join next year. Um, I'm sure the information is already on the site for 2021. It's a great event. And um, Joy just did an amazing work putting that on. Well, thank you all for listening. Joy, thank you for coming on today. I have so enjoyed talking to you as always. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much.